Growing up in the mountains of North Georgia, camping and hiking were things me and my brother did so often, it was second nature. So any time Ryan and I had a break from school, we would head straight for the woods. We packed our gear, let our parents know where we were going, and that was that. No questions asked. We decided to camp about midways through Jack's River Trail in the Kohutta Wilderness, and it's a trail we knew fairly well, as we had used to a few times before, to practice long hikes. We arrived at the trail head around lunchtime, parked the car, got our gear out, and headed into the woods. We passed a few hikers as moved along and asked them how the trail looked, and the answer was always the same, wet. Jack's River Trail probably crossed the river 50 times as it went along its 17-mile-plus journey, and with the colder temperatures of late fall settling in, it was harder for the trail to stay dry. We moved deeper into the trail and started to look for a place to make camp. This is where Ryan and I made our first mistake. You see, Ryan and I have this rule. We don't camp near people, if at all possible. Call us paranoid, but the last thing we want is for someone to drag us out of our tents and into the woods, never to be seen again. So we always camped a pretty decent way as off of the trail and in the area that wasn't popular with overnight camping. Roughly two and a half hours or so, we found what we thought was the perfect place to set up for the two nights that we would be out. We came up to Horseshoe Bend and ventured about half a mile off the trail into a clearing and set up. We built a teepee fire lay for that night and pitched our tents on either side. After setting up and unloading, we decided to walk back to the trail and go exploring around some of many swimming holes Jack's River had to offer. This was during Thanksgiving break, and I remember being surprised at how few people were on the trail. Maybe it was the weather or the fact that this was early in the week, but there didn't seem to be anyone hiking, much less staying the night. Around five o'clock, Ryan and I headed back to camp to start our fire, make dinner, and settle in for the night. As soon as the sun began to set, the cold rushed in. We added more wood to the fire, sat close, and just enjoyed conversation. Ryan was two years behind me in school. I was a senior, and he was a sophomore, but growing up, we had always been close. We always hung out in the same groups, played the same sports, had the same hobbies, etc. Around nine, we were settled comfortably around the fire. I had just texted our mom to let her know we were safe and getting ready for bed, and I remember we were talking about dreading going to our grandparents' house for Thanksgiving and having the same awkward conversations we had each year with family we only saw on holidays when things started to get strange. We were no stranger to sounds in the woods, and these woods were full of animals, from deer to black bears, and even the random wild boar. If you were in the woods enough, you learned to distinguish certain sounds, and what we were hearing I can only chalk up to as odd. What Ryan and I heard was what sounded like someone sneaking around slowly just out of eyesight. With an animal walking on four legs, you hear a tighter group of steps. But what we were hearing sounded very distinct to what a human sounds like when walking slowly or trying to move without making much sound. I remember we both pulled out our flashlights and shone it in the direction we felt the sounds were coming from. But that is what was so weird. Whenever we would fix our lights on a spot, we thought the sound were coming from the location of the sound, would suddenly change. It was as if there were multiple people walking around us. That's when the whistling started. At first I thought it was the wind, and I remember thinking, maybe the wind is just throwing leaves around, and what we are hearing is nothing but the wilderness around us. Ryan looked at me and asked if I was hearing that. I didn't answer and was trying to focus hard on each individual sound. Two consecutive notes with roughly a three to four second gap and then two more consecutive notes over and over again. Ryan kept asking if I heard that and I put my finger to my lips trying to keep him from talking. The fear I felt was incredible. My jaw was tight, my fist clenched, knowing I wasn't ready for whatever was out there if it was anything at all. The whistling continued for what felt like forever, but thinking it through, 
was maybe five minutes when Ryan finally yelled out into the darkness. Hey, quiet. The whistling stopped. The crunching of the wood stopped. Nothing. I was pissed. I looked at Ryan with a what-the-hell look, and he shrugged his shoulders. I had to do something, he said. I just shook my head. We sat there in silence for a few minutes when the woods erupted with noise. Something or someone was running in a circle around our campsite. The whistling came back. Two consecutive notes with the same three to four second gap and then two more consecutive notes. How could someone whistle this loudly without cracking while also running? I was done. I stood up shining my flashlight in all directions trying to catch a glimpse of whatever was screwing with us. Nothing. It felt close enough to touch, but we never saw a thing. That's when the movement stopped, but the whistling was still constant. It was so loud, inhumanly loud. I looked at Ryan and told him to call the police. Now this is the part I will never forget, the part I never liked to talk about. While Ryan was on the phone with a dispatcher and telling them our location and what was going on, I stepped around the fire towards my tent. Inside my bag, I had a six-inch fixed blade that I always carried and thought I would feel a bit more comfortable with it in my hand more than just my flashlight. As I went to unzip my tent, trying to keep my eyes toward the woods, I heard some movement directly in front of me. I swept my light up in front of me, and for maybe two seconds I saw it. Whatever this person or thing was, it was about five feet up in a tree. Everything about it was long. Its arms, legs, neck, fingers, everything. And it was fast. As soon as the light hit it, launched backwards off of the tree. I heard it land, but it either jumped an impossible distance or landed in a thicket because I heard it but never saw. I don't think I have ever yelled so loud. I ran back to where Ryan was and sat down. He kept asking me what I saw, but I couldn't answer. I just kept thinking about what I saw. Maybe ten minutes later, we saw a couple of flashlight beams coming through the woods, and about three guys came into view, asking if everything was okay. I settled a bit and started asking them if they had seen or heard anything. All they said was they heard a lot of movement, and then heard my scream, and that's when they headed in our direction. I tried to explain what had happened without sounding crazy, but it didn't seem to work. One of the guys walked around a bit and came back and said he didn't see anything. Ryan told them that we called the police, and roughly 30 minutes later, a park ranger showed up. Ryan and I tried explaining everything to him, but he just chalked it up to either a curious animal or some campers trying to mess with us. Either way, Ryan and I had decided we weren't staying the night. We packed our stuff up and walked out of the woods with the ranger. He took our statement, and we got in our car and drove home. Ryan and I don't talk about what happened that night, but neither of us have been back to Jack's River Trail, and we'll probably never go back. The snow-laden wilderness stretched out before us, a desolate and beautiful expanse that held both wonder and danger in its icy embrace. As a seasoned park ranger, I had faced the challenges of this remote national park many times, but the harsh winter months brought a unique set of trials. My team and I were well prepared, our supplies stocked, and our determination unwavering as we settled into the ranger station, ready to manage the park during its most unforgiving season. The first weeks passed with a familiar rhythm. The tranquil beauty of the snow-covered landscape masking the lurking threats that nature could unleash. But as the winds howled and the snowfall intensified, it became evident that this winter would be unlike any we had experienced before. A powerful blizzard descended upon the park, its fury trapping us within the walls of our station, a lone outpost against the merciless elements. The cozy camaraderie that had initially warmed our spirits now turned into a claustrophobic confinement. Tension simmered beneath the surface as we huddled together, our laughter and camaraderie replaced by anxious whispers and mistrustful glances. The isolation gnawed at our sanity, and soon paranoia took root, infecting even the closest bonds among us. It was in the midst of this mounting unease that the first disappearance occurred.
A member of our team vanished without a trace, leaving behind only a chilling sense of foreboding. Panic swept through us, our minds racing to find logical explanations, yet finding none that could account for the eerie silence that settled over the ranger station. As the days stretched on, the disappearances continued, each one leaving us more shaken than the last. Fear tightened its grip on our hearts, and I found myself haunted by the chilling tales of local Native American legends. A creature known as the Wendigo, a malevolent spirit said to possess those who resort to cannibalism in times of desperation. The thought was absurd, a relic of folklore and superstition. Yet, as the storm raged outside, I couldn't ignore the unsettling parallels between our situation and the Wendigo's curse. The blizzard had driven us to the brink of desperation, and with each passing day it seemed that something sinister was lurking just beyond our sight, feeding on our fears and uncertainty. I took it upon myself to investigate, to unravel the mystery that threatened to consume us all. Clutching my flashlight and heart pounding, I ventured into the snow-covered wilderness, following the faint traces of footprints that led into the forest. The howling wind seemed to whisper warnings, and every shadow seemed to conceal a malevolent presence. My journey brought me deeper into the heart of the park, until I stumbled upon a grisly sight, a makeshift campsite strewn with torn clothing and broken equipment. The realization struck me like a blow. We were not alone, and something was hunting us, picking us off one by one. Returning to the ranger station, I knew that I had to share my discoveries to rally the remaining members of my team and devise a plan to survive. But as I stepped through the door, I was met with empty eyes and a chilling silence. The others had gathered, their gazes vacant and movements unnatural. It was then that I saw it, the telltale signs of the Wendigo's curse. Sunken eyes, emaciated frames, a hunger that could not be sated. I raised my flashlight, its beam illuminating their twisted forms, and in their hollow eyes I saw a glimmer of recognition, a spark of humanity buried beneath the curse. With every ounce of my being, I pleaded with them to fight against the malevolent force that had taken hold. The battle that ensued was a desperate struggle, a fight not just for our lives, but for our very souls. The storm outside mirrored the tempest that raged within us. As the cursed among us fought to break free from the Wendigo's grasp, it was a battle that tested our strength, our resilience, and our unwavering determination to survive. When the blizzard finally subsided, leaving behind a landscape forever changed, we emerged from the ranger station, battered but victorious. The Wendigo's curse had been shattered, its hold over my teammates broken by their fierce will to resist. As I surveyed the snow-covered expanse before us, I couldn't help but reflect on the darkness that had threatened to consume us. The legends of the Wendigo had proven to be more than mere stories. They were a reminder that even in the face of unimaginable horrors, the human spirit is capable of enduring, of rising above the darkness that seeks to claim us. And so... As the sun cast its gentle rays over the once frozen wilderness, I vowed to protect this remote national park in the secrets it held. Our battle against the Wendigo had taught me that the truest test of our strength is not in the absence of fear, but in our ability to confront it, to face the darkness head, on and to emerge from the shadows stronger than before. My dad used to take long walks on the roads around our house with his dog. Most everything is thick, deciduous forest with open, hilly farmland in between. Some areas of the forest were planned subdivisions, but the projects were abandoned, never started, so there are many old gravel, dirt roads cutting through the brush. The most hidden dirt roads started about a mile from our house ran through very thick woods and popped out about half a mile on the other side. My dad, walking his dog at night, sees a figure at the entrance to the road. It was what looked like a man shirtless and with no light. He snapped a picture of the man standing there looking straight at him. The camera flash turned his eyes bright red. 
Sometime later, we ventured back down the road, and there was a little living area halfway down. There was a little bit of food, a raised bed built into a tree, and some stuffed animals lying around. It was probably just a homeless man living there, but it still scared the hell out of me. I was in Missouri visiting my grandparents one summer, and we decided to go camping about a week before I left for home. It's been so long that I can't quite remember where it is we camped, but I do remember that we went there because it was known for Bigfoot sightings. So the first day was uneventful. We toasted marshmallows and whatever. Everything was normal. The next day, my friend John and my cousin Kevin wanted to explore nearby, and our parents let us go. While we were out there, we found a deer carcass next to the creek. Its head looked like it had been ripped off and thrown to the side, and its back half was nowhere to be found. I said it must have been a bear and that it was probably far gone by then, but Kevin and John were still pretty shook up, so they went back. I continued on for about three or four hours. And that's when I saw a storm heading in. I rushed back, ate real quick, and then we all went to sleep like normal. We had left out our dog, Roscoe, tied to a tree with a tarp as a tent. I know that sounds bad, but it was completely dry inside. I don't know what time it was, but it was at least midnight when he started barking. My grandpa went out to calm him down, and I went with him. When we got over there, we saw that he had chewed off his leash, and he was barking out into the woods, but neither of us could see what sense it was pitch black. We both shrugged it off, thinking it was just some rodent or a raccoon or something, and we went back to sleep. An hour or so later, we heard tearing and yelping and a roar so loud that I actually fell down while I was getting out of bed. When I got up, I found my grandpa by Roscoe's tent which was shredded, and there was blood on the ground. I ran back to the tent, grabbed a flashlight, and ran into the forest after him, which now, thinking back, was a really bad idea. I followed a path of broken branches and blood back to the creek where we had found the deer when I heard another roar. I dropped my flashlight to cover my ears, and it shined right across the water and onto two feet. They looked like human feet, except bigger and they were completely covered in black hair like a shag rug. I picked the flashlight back up and shined it higher, but it had started running away already, and it was fast, faster than I'd ever seen anyone run. But I did see its back and the back of its head and legs. It must have been at least eight feet tall, and its shoulders were about two times the width of mine. It was absolutely huge. I probably sat by that creek for an hour, just contemplating what I had seen and I never did find my dog. The only possibility is that that thing killed him. I haven't been in those woods since, and I always carry a knife and bring a rifle with me when I do go camping. Bigfoot killed my dog last time. It's not going to take a person next time. So I was once awake at 5 a.m. getting ready for a trip to another city with people in my class. I happened to wander around the kitchen window that sees the street and saw a woman that looked kind of odd. Odd as in, she had very messy long hair around her elbows, and she walked like she had been hurt, limping and holding her stomach. She didn't seem to be in any trouble, and she was walking this really big dog. I didn't really think much of it. I hadn't seen her face, just caught a glimpse as she walked away with her dog. In a half an hour or so, I saw her again, without the dog this time. What's odd is she was walking the same path, but not walking back, just walking the exact same way as before, and now the dog was gone. I tried to make sense of the situation as where the dog went and why the woman happened to take a full turn to head to exact same direction, now alone. Her odd way of walking was the same, and she still held her belly. I didn't get to see her face and caught her after she got past my view range once again. A few weeks passed, maybe even a month or two. Sometimes I mentioned her and talked about how old that was and discussed what she might have been doing. One day I saw her again, very close to a time I had just randomly talked about her. Could have been the same day or maybe the day after. 
She didn't have the dog, but she wore the exact same clothes and walked slowly, holding her belly. And I once again caught her passing the street, not able to see her face, but only the messy hair. Not to mention the hour was quite late again and the streets were empty. Now, I found it really odd I came across this woman three times in a row, walking the same direction. And not once I caught a glimpse of her face. I always happened to be looking out from the kitchen window during late hours as well. Our neighborhood is small, and we mostly know who has a dog as people walk them around regularly. I lived here all my life, never once saw this woman, just three times in a row in span of a few months or so. If anyone has a theory what she might been up to, especially the day she walked up the street twice with and without the dog, I'd really like to hear it. Ocus was really creepy to me, but I could have just been sleep deprived at the time. So it was 2 a.m. I was down in the kitchen making food when all of a sudden I hear this really strange noise. I don't know how else to describe it besides a mix of the Roblox of sound effect and my dog barking. My dogs were upstairs. It came from outside. I'm pretty sure outside my window near on the porch. After I went upstairs, I was telling my friend about it. He tells me, dude, that might have been a wendigo. They make weird, familiar sounds to try and lure people into the woods. If they mark you, they'll sneak into your house and try and watch you sleep. Now, you might think that's just him trying to scare me, right? Well, a few nights after, I was going to the bathroom, and when I stepped out of the bathroom and turned the hall lights off, I glanced down the stairs and saw this really thin white figure. Now, naturally, I just avoided eye contact and booked it to my room. A few nights later, I was downstairs and shutting off the lights to go back upstairs. When out of the corner of my eye, I saw a white figure appear in my living room as I shut the light out. Now, I swear I'm hearing scratching outside my door from time to time. It's not quick like my dog's. It's a kind of slow scratch. Okay, so I live next to an abandoned asylum. I see things moving and floating that's normal for me, but the creepiest thing I've is... While sighting drawing under a tree middle of nowhere where I saw a small child that wouldn't have been weird. Until she didn't have anyone with her. She wandered past me and seemingly disappeared after a while. When I was traveling back to down, I saw a lady with a wide smile on the side of the road. I drove for 50 kilometers and see the same lady with the same wide smile again. I thought she might have hitchhiked and reached there. I traveled another 20 kilometers and saw the same lady, same dress, and same wide smile. I felt something was not right. I didn't show my fear and smiled back at her, saw her again a couple more times, and she disappeared. Really don't know how she managed to do that for such long distances. I guess it'll always be a mystery. Me and my sisters used to live in Georgia. There was a trail in our neighborhood that the power company used to maintain their lines, and me and my sisters used to walk through there. One night we saw a dead deer and then got grossed out and turned back. I glanced back because I thought I felt like someone was watching me, and I saw a black figure looking like it was wearing a cloak and carrying an orange light, leaning over the dead deer. I screamed, which caused my sisters to look, too, and then we all started running. And the whole way home, we heard creepy stuff in the woods and saw the orange light. Our parents didn't believe us when we got home lost. While going out early to hunt deer with my little brother, we started hiking up the East Ridge Trail about an hour or so before sunrise. I took the lead and had a rifle and very dim flashlight. It was very underpowered. I could only see a few feet ahead on the trail. Since we were just going to walk in on the trail, I figured it was good enough to find our way. 
A mile or so into our hike, we could hear something walking through the brush very loudly to our left, which is the uphill side of the trail. There were dry leaves on the ground, so it was definitely very loud and a distinct sound of footsteps, like a man walking through brush. We stopped and listened. Of course, the light wouldn't light it up, so it was in the shadows, but close enough that if I had a modern headlamp sold today, I could have seen it easily. Anyway, when we stopped, so did it. We started moving again. I could clearly hear it. Because the trail was extremely dry and our footsteps were quiet compared to the brush, it eventually walked in front of us and came down to the trail. Again, we stopped and crouched to listen. I aimed my gun that direction in case it charged. Then it went to our right, very slowly, which was below us, and stopped. My brother was scared, and I tried to calm him by telling him it was a deer, but I knew better. No deer walks like that and stays that close. We started walking again, paying attention to the low side of the hill. We moved slowly, and again, this thing started walking again. This time it periled us on the low side. Again, we stopped, and it stopped. When we moved, it started moving again and came back up to the trail. Very freaky, for sure. We stopped again and turned around, and it did not move. Then we started walking again. Away from it, obviously, and it headed up the hill behind us. We walked a little faster, and it started to walk above us in the brush parallel to us. Again, until it passed us. In other words, it circled us. Eventually, it was up the hill in front of us and came back down to the trail. Again, we crouched and listened carefully. It stopped again, but I could hear its feet on the trail. For a moment, I thought it was coming toward us, so I decided to yell out, I have a gun. If you're another hunter and you are walking toward us, let us know you are there or you're going to get shot. I'm warning you. I could hear it walking down the trail slowly toward us, and then it stopped, turned downhill again quickly and walked again very loudly down the hill until we couldn't hear any more. We started walking again very quickly now and got out of that area toward where we wanted to hunt until the light of day. On the way back in broad daylight, we searched for tracks, but it was so dry and warm that the ground was rock hard. I just don't think it was on four legs. The sand was just too bipedal as if a man was hiking quickly with intention through the brush. The sound was swoosh, swoosh. Typically, deer either hop or step carefully. I've never heard a cougar, but I would think the sound of its footsteps would have been less singular in sound. Plus, it was very heavy-footed. I'm not saying it was Bigfoot. I just don't know. Unless another man with the ability to see in the dark was messing with us, I just don't know what else it could have been. I was born on the evening of June 24, 1975, in New York City, one month prematurely while my parents were there visiting my mother's family in various East Coast locations from our home in St. Louis, Missouri. In 2015, a friend of mine took me to New Orleans for a few days prior to my birthday as a gift. We had a great time and had tickets to fly home in the early afternoon on my birthday. The flight out of Louis Armstrong Airport was uneventful except for two things. The first was an older guy sitting beside us who kept looking our way. He had what I can only describe as a gentle smile on his face. I didn't feel creeped out so much, but it was just weird to have him spend so much time looking our way in silence. The next thing was when we started to descend for landing. The plane started to shake and jolt terribly. My buddy and I looked at each other with that O.F. expression. I glanced past my friend and caught the eye of the man sitting across the aisle. He was looking straight at me with that grin still on his face. He leaned out from his seat toward ours and said very calmly in a firm tone, This one will land just fine. Then turned his head and looked forward. That gentle smile never left his face. From there, the ride got really rough, but the plane landed just fine. The pilot came on the intercom and quickly explained that it was some pretty bad wind shear, gave us a weather update, and thanked us for flying. Everyone on the plane was so stressed, I swear I could smell the fear. As we got our carry, on side of the overheads, I made a point to not even glance at that dude, but I could feel him looking at me. We got off and hustled our butts out of there. Nobody was saying a word. 
We were all still freaking out. Here's where it gets creepy. Last year, I was reading about air disasters. That experience stuck with me, and I developed a bit of an obsession. One day, I came across the story of Eastern Airlines Flight 66. The flight left New Orleans in the early afternoon on June 24, 1975, en route to Jeff Kive in New York City. The plane crashed on the descent due to severe wind shear, killing 113 people just hours before I was born, 40 years to the day from my flight with a man in his gentle grin. My man in black encounter happened in 2011, and it was something that I'll never forget. First, a bit of a backstory. Prior to the man in black incident, I went on a camping trip to Joshua Tree National Park, California, with a few friends. On our last night there, we were looking at the stars in front of the campfire. That's when I witnessed a couple of glowing blue UFOs in the night sky, going at amazing speeds. I couldn't believe what I was seeing, and my friends were equally amazed and mystified. I tried to take a photo with my flip phone, but the UFOs moved too fast for me to get a clear image of them. On our drive back home, we talked more about what we saw and were really excited about it. Not long after, I noticed a black car following me from a distance. I switched lanes to make sure the black car was in fact following me, and sure enough, wherever I went, the car followed then when I glanced at my rearview mirror again, the car suddenly disappeared without a trace, which was really unsettling. Now the man in black encounter. The next day, after running a few errands, I started driving home, and when I arrived at my house, I saw a black Cadillac parked in my driveway. I tried to convince myself that it wasn't the same black car following me a day ago, but my gut feeling told me otherwise. When I got out of my car, two men in matching black suits, light gray dress shirts, black ties, and black fedoras approached me and asked if they could ask me a few questions about what I witnessed the night before. I asked them who they were and to see some credentials. They claimed that they worked for a division of the United States Air Force. Their appearance looked what I can only describe as plastic and expressionless, and they both had a pale olive skin tone. They spoke in a raspy, monotone voice, and their speech was very precise, sounding almost synthetic. They also had a very cold and intense gaze. Some of the questions they asked were, Can you describe what you saw that night? What do you think you saw? Did you take any photos of what you witnessed? Were there others who might have had recording devices or cameras? Do you know if anyone recorded the incident? Have you spoken about this incident with anyone else who wasn't present with you that night? Did you find any unusual debris at the location you were that night? Would you be withholding any important information from us? Of course, I didn't answer most of their questions honestly, and I did withhold a lot of information as to what I saw and who I was with. They ended their questioning by strongly advising me to refrain from talking about what I witnessed with anyone and to forget the incident ever happened. They also strongly implied that they would be keeping an eye on me in case I decided to ignore their demands. After the encounter, I had this constant ominous feeling for a while and always looked over my shoulder wherever I went. I don't know who these men were or how they had knowledge of what I saw that night, but I believe that they were the men in black. Since that encounter, I've been really hesitant and careful about who I share my experience with, but I finally decided to share it here. During the years following that incident, I've only had a couple of UFO sightings at night on separate occasions, but I haven't had any more visits from odd men dressed in black. Not yet, anyway. I moved to Minnesota about six months ago. It's a pretty cold state. More or less, I love it here. It's very peaceful, and when it snows, it's really beautiful. However, my image of Minnesota was changed last night. Me, my mom, and my stepfather were all sitting down, watching a movie in the living room. As the movie was about to end, we paused it because my mom wanted to go smoke, and I had to use the restroom. Once I'm back from using the restroom... I go and sit down with my stepdad. 
A few seconds later, my mom opens the patio door and yells for us to get out there. We rush outside and she tells us that she started hearing the noise of something big walking in the snow. When she started to look around for where the noise was coming from, about 40 feet away was a white trailer. She said that when she looked over there, she saw something with red eyes staring at her. She said that it looked like a really big dog. At first, my stepdad said that it was probably a coyote. Then I started to think on how my mom heard a coyote walking in the snow 40 or 50 feet away. I realized that it had to have been something very big. I've always been one to believe in paranormal things. My mother, not so much. We look around for a bit longer, then we go back inside. A few hours later, I leave my room to go grab a soda so I can continue playing Halo. After the whole event, I've had this unshakable feeling. So I decided to just look outside to reassure myself that she was seeing things. As my eyes scan the edge of the woods, I don't really see anything. I take a deep breath, and I grab the soda and close the fridge. As I close the door, I glimpse out the window and freeze. Sure enough, I see a pair of red eyes peering at me through the trees. I couldn't see much because of how dark it was. It was around 3 a.m., but I know what I saw. I saw something that I've never seen before. Those red eyes went right through me. Then, as quick as I had seen them, they disappear. What did I see? I'm a Aaron, a cryptid hunter and investigator. One day, someone named Howard sent me a message that he wanted to talk with me, so I obliged. I had spoken with a security guard named Howard H., who worked south of Malala. Howard's job was to keep an eye on timber company equipment and other assets. When I asked Howard about Bigfoot, he was initially hesitant to speak, but eventually opened up about many screams and calls he had heard near his trailer. What surprised me was that Howard claimed to have seen two different types of Bigfoot creatures. One was shorter, with startling blue eyes and reddish hair, while the other was larger and more aggressive, often stalking him. He even believed that the creatures could imitate animal sounds, and recounted a time when a cougar scream turned into a typical Bigfoot scream, whatever that is. Howard also told me about an incident on the Clear Lake Trail near Goat Mountain, where he felt like he was being followed but couldn't see anything. He even left a bite of his bologna sandwich on a log, only to return later and find it replaced by a chunk of tree bark. Hower also mentioned seeing trees twisted over at a height of nine, ten feet, and stacks of fir boughs and mushrooms strangely piled up in certain areas. Recently, Howard had noted tracks on the weekend of October 1920, although the location was not specified. I was planning to interview him in depth and was particularly interested in an old logging road that was now closed due to fallen timber, but it would be an interesting trip for the IWBS whatever that was, when there was snow on the ground. I grew up on Long Island in New York State. My older sister, her boyfriend, and myself often would walk the trails and the beaches at night. On one particular evening, the three of us were on a walk at Camp Hero State Park. It was a full moon, so it was very bright out. As we were walking the trail, we stopped to relax and look out over the water. My sister's boyfriend sparked up a joint, and we all were partaking and relaxing. Whilst we were gazing out onto the open water, we spotted a small light in the distance. My sister inquired as to what we thought that was. Her boyfriend said it was probably a light on a distant boat, I agreed, and we didn't think much of it. However, as moments passed, we noticed the light seemed to be approaching us. Getting closer by the minute, as it moved closer, it appeared to not be on the water, but above the water in the sky. We soon realized it was not a light on a distant boat. We continued to speculate what it was, and I came to the conclusion that it must be someone's small personal drone. But as the light came closer and closer, the brightness got stronger and stronger. If you know Camp Hero, you know that there are cliff edges that hang over the water. There, we are standing there on the edge with this orb steadily approaching us. Within the span of five minutes, 
The orb was no longer in the distance, but hanging right in front of us. It was no longer over the water, but rather over the sandy beach. We stood there staring at it. It had a whitish-purple glow to it. Despite being night, it was bright out due to the light of the full moon. On this high-visibility evening, it became evident this was no drone. This light was stand-alone, no machinery of any kind attached to it. And it just hung there about ten feet in front of us for about thirty seconds. It then just disappeared, in such a way that it almost seemed to envelop itself. We all decided to get the hell out of there, and that was that. This was back in 2015-ish. I've since visited this particular park many times since and have never seen anything like it again. Maybe we were all just a bunch of stone teenagers and it was some sort of group delusion, but that night will sick with me forever. The park itself is shrouded in mystery and I can only speculate that the orb was perhaps a remnant of one of the experiments conducted at Camp Hero from back in the day. So last night I was on my way to my boyfriend's house in the middle of nowhere. I have been living with him for a few months now and have never seen anything strange or out of the ordinary. As I was a few miles into his backcountry road, something that I can most relate to looking like a really tall skinny dog was walking on the side of the road. I was going fast so I didn't get an amazing look at it but what I could see was a black face with two flesh-colored holes where the eyes were supposed to be and a flesh-colored hole where the mouth should have been. I don't know about you guys, but when I almost hit an animal, I'm like instantly stunned and feel bad and I swerve, but it was like my body knew this thing was more normal. I didn't get that awe, oh, I almost hit an animal feeling, but a feeling of what the EF was at my mouth involuntarily dropped open by the pure shock. I didn't see the body, but only an outline of the face shape and also two black hind legs that were very lanky. Has anybody else seen something like this? I used to live in an area that was surrounded by woods and wildlife, with only a handful of people and domestic animals around. It was a beautiful and peaceful place to live, but that year was particularly rough for me. My father had passed away, and I was still trying to come to terms with his loss. But then something strange started happening in my house. People who had never lived there before were dying, and I was having strange dreams with my family. I didn't know what to make of it, but I tried to ignore it and carry on with my life. One day... I was contacted by a spiritual page who recommended that I talk to my landlord's brother, who apparently didn't want to scare me, and was just saying hello. I thought it was weird, but I decided to go along with it and say hi back. That night, things got even stranger. I heard my name being yelled in the house, and the phone rang once at 1.30 in the morning. I was terrified, and strange noises outside followed. I was paralyzed with fear lying in bed and trying to ignore everything that was happening around me. The noises continued for weeks, and I realized that if I wanted to deal with this haunted stuff, I needed to be within walking distance of not haunted or blessed places like my neighbors or churches. I was no stranger to spirits, but this was the first time I had ever been so scared. I decided to move to a different area, one that was less isolated and had more people around. It was hard to leave that beautiful place, but I knew I had to do it for my own sanity. I never did find out what was causing all of those strange things to happen, but I was just glad to be away from it all. A friend and I loaded a couple of rifles in his Volkswagen Squareback to go up some logging roads to try to find someone's marijuana crops and pick some. We drove these barren logging roads for about an hour and decided to pull over and smoke a joint. As he sat there waiting for me to roll a joint, we heard what sounded like rocks rolling down the hill behind us. 
I looked over my left shoulder and probably 100 feet or so. Behind us, I saw what I thought was a bear laying on the road, apparently dazed from its slide or fall down the mountain. As this bear stood up, it turned toward us and just stared. I then realized instantly that this was no bear or ape I've ever seen before. This thing was probably eight, nine feet tall and maybe six hundred, eight hundred pounds. I was so terrified. I even forgot we had rifles to fend this thing off or defend myself. It stood there looking at us. It seemed like a lifetime, but was probably only five, ten seconds. It then turned down the mountain and kind of slid on its butt. As he did this, my partner started the car and we got the hell out of there. We didn't say a word to each other going back to town, nor did we smoke any pot. We were driving home from our vacation in Florida. It was on Saturday, June 3, 2016. Just after dinner, around 8 p.m., we were passing through North Carolina on I-95. I was cruising along at around 70 miles per hour when I noticed a large camper in my rearview mirror. I moved to the right lane and thought nothing more of the vehicle as it passed me on the left. The interior was lit up, and all the blinds were down. I saw several silhouettes of people as the camper pulled ahead of and in front of my vehicle. As the camper began to pull away, someone stood up in the back, close to the rear door. All of a sudden, a pair of wings unfolded from the person's shoulder blade area. They were wide and membranous, with claws at a couple of points along the top edge. They reminded me of pedrodactyl wings, or thin bat wings. I could see enough light through them to make out the wing bones. That's not all. At the top of the man's head were two small, curved horns. My first thought was that it was a gargoyle. I was shocked, to say the least. My family was asleep at the time. The wings appeared to be real, pulsing and flexing as the person or humanoid moved toward the front of the camper. As I wondered what to do next, the camper pulled off an exit and disappeared. To this day, I'd swear it was a being with real wings. Sir, I'm 43 years old and come from a military family, with my maternal grandfather having possible ties to the U.S. government and other extraordinary facts about him. Since the beginning of July 2013, I have had more obvious signs that something is going on while we sleep. On the morning of July 1, 2013, I woke up feeling more exhausted than usual. While walking to the restroom, I noticed a triangular-shaped series of dots bruise on my thigh just above the right knee, thinking that it was curious to have that shape there. About a week later, I hit one on my other leg, the same shape and same size, and was more toward the inside of my thigh. I wake up with various bruising and that sort of thing, but never think that much about it. These things were coming to be more frequent and definitely more blatant. On the morning of August 17, 2013, I woke up to having a badly bloodshot left eye. It felt like I had something scratched it, even after it has appeared to heal. I also had small bruises and a strange series of puncture holes and a crescent shape on the top of my left thigh. The previous year, I can't give you a date, but sometime before September 2012, I woke up to a feeling like there was something in my left ear. I find it more than coincidental that this is my left thigh, crescent, shaped puncture wound, left ear, and left ear, and left eye. I have not been to a doctor for several reasons. I don't have insurance. I don't like doctors, and I am afraid of what they might think and what they will do to me. On Sunday, August 31, 2013, one of my dogs who sleeps in my bedroom woke me up at about 4 a.m. in a panic. She was attempting to hide behind the nightstand and panting. I took her to the emergency vet, and they found nothing wrong with her. That is when I decided to do more research and look for investigators, support groups, etc. Whatever was happening, it also affected my animals, and that is not okay. They cannot speak for themselves, and I have no memories of anything, so I need to find out. I am finding it difficult to find anyone locally. It started almost ten years ago and is still occurring, but to a lesser degree.
Do you believe I'm being abducted? If you can offer any help, I'd appreciate it. I had something highly strange occur in 2015, another incident in a lifetime of inexplicable experiences. And I would appreciate any thoughts that you might share with me concerning this event. I read the obits in my local newspaper occasionally, as I sometimes worry that one of my old friend's parents or someone I've known has passed on, and I would want to express condolences. My own parents died suddenly very close together, and I know how important that expressions of sympathy can be. This concerns an obit that I read last summer. I noticed it because the woman was a prominent lady who was a high school friend of my mother's and also the mother-in-law of my son's cousin. She had died of cancer, and it was doubly sad because her granddaughter was going to be the queen of our local Rose Festival the following October. This is a great honor in our city, and the woman herself had actually been a Rose Queen in 1955. Her granddaughter is the daughter of my son's cousin James, so my son and I discussed the news at length. He was getting married in November of that year and was inviting members of that family to his wedding. So I actually shared the news of her death with a few people and remember that well. Imagine my surprise when I read the local obits in June 2017 and saw that she had died recently. The story of her death was prominently featured and I read it in disbelief and utter shock again and again. I called my son, and he was confused as well, as I had already reported her passing to him two years previous. What can this mean? Did I have visual precognition of her death two years before it occurred? Did I experience a time slip going into the future to read her a bit? Or did time curve back on itself and confuse me with a double death? This event has truly been worrisome to me. Am I losing my mind and memory? The week before Memorial Day in 2017, I had the random thought that a distant great aunt of mine had passed and called several relatives to inquire about it. No, she was not dead, but no one knew anything about her situation. If she had been ill, was living with her daughter? She was 92, but eight days later I got the news that she had actually died six days after my phone calls. What are your thoughts? Growing up in Montana, I was no stranger to the wild beauty of nature, but one particular incident still stands out as the most thrilling and terrifying experience of my life. One summer day, three of my friends and I decided to go for a hike on some private property on the outskirts of the city. We were all eager to spend time in the great outdoors, and nothing could have prepared us for what we were about to witness. As we trekked through the woods, we suddenly heard a commotion coming from the steep tree line nearby. We saw a deer sprinting down the slope as if its life depended on it. And that's when we saw it. A massive Sasquatch emerged from the woods and pounced on the deer. The deer tripped, and they both landed just about 15 feet away from us. We were all stunned, our hearts racing with a mixture of fear and adrenaline. Without any hesitation, we ran down the hill, trying to put as much distance between us and the scene as possible. We waited, hidden behind some trees and bushes, watching the area where the Sasquatch had disappeared with the deer. After what felt like an eternity, the creature emerged from the tree line, dragging the deer by its leg. We watched in awe as it vanished back into the woods, taking its prey with it. The encounter left me with an uneasy feeling, and for over a year, I couldn't bring myself to venture into the woods at night. Despite the fear that it instilled in me, I can't deny that it was the most incredible thing I have ever seen. I'll never forget the day that I came face to face with a Sasquatch, a legend that had suddenly become a reality right before my eyes. My Nana's house has a bit of a sad history. The house was built on a plot of land as a dream home for a newly wed and pregnant couple. Shortly before move-in day, the wife was shot and killed while getting off a bus downtown. 
The husband, in his grief, shortly after killed himself. The house then went to market, and my, my papa bought it for Nana. They were also newlyweds. As time went by, weird things started happening in the house. Little things like lighters would go missing, or the remote, which was on the coffee table, would be found under the couch, or you could hear the pool balls from the pool table crack even though they were in their case. This freaked my papa out, but Nana was much harder to scare. Every now and then you'd see scratch marks on the cathedral ceilings, only to hire a painter and they are gone the day he would show up. This happened on four occasions. Still, Nana was not scared. Shortly after, Papa had an accident and he passed. This left Nana alone in the house. Years pass, and in my teens, I move from my country and in with Nana. And walking to the kitchen one day, and I hear Nana talking. She is saying, Don't you touch them again, you old witch. I pop into the kitchen and ask Nana who she is talking to. Mabel, she replies. I assume Mabel is one of the cats she's rescued and carry on. Every now and then, I hear Nana talking to Mabel. It's usually, don't you touch this, or would you stop that? Playing with the lights, knocking over a fan. It never occurs to me to address it. Till one night, I have this horrific dream about a woman being shot. I wake up terrified, and I see almost like a dark shadow fading from the foot of the bed. Am completely freaked out, but just think it's my eyes adjusting after being bolted away. The following morning, I tell Nana about my dream over breakfast. Oh, that's just Mabel. She'll come to you from time to time. I was wondering when she was going to show herself to you, she says. I'm taken aback, and Nana tells me the Mabel story and how Mabel was the wife. I ask Nana, is that who she's been talking to, and she confirms it is. As time goes on, little things start to go missing as usual, and I'm creeped out at first, but make a game out of it by hiding things and moving glasses when family is around and saying, Oh, Mabel, Nana's cigarettes go missing. Must have been Mabel. Mabel one night on Christmas Eve decided to walk up the stairs and her footsteps got a little too close for comfort and I shouted, stop it, Mabel. You're scaring me and they stop. Fast forward again and I've moved out of the house. Nana has passed away and me and my sister are tasked with going through her things. No one has been in the house for months. The power has been turned off and me and my sister enter the home after sundown. Once we're on the front landing... From a landing, you can see the downstairs to the left of us and upstairs to the top landing. Standing in the entryway, something just didn't feel right. We go upstairs and start to collect some things. I'm going through Nana's china and my sister walks into the dining room and says, Tell me you heard that. What? Tell me you hear that baby crying? I stop. Listen. And I do. It's very faint and it's coming from the basement. I ask my sister if the TV in one of the basement bedrooms could be on. She reminds me the power is cut. I ask if it's a neighbor, but we live a quarter mile from anyone. We walk to the living room, and I lean over the landing, and sure as hell there is a baby crying. I tell my sister to call the police, and I go down slowly to the second landing. My sister exits the house. From the second landing, I slowly proceed towards the basement fearing a crackhead or something may have broken into the empty house and made this place their home. When I get to the bottom of the steps, what I felt can only be described as what you feel when a car is close to you with an incredibly loud bass system where you feel and hear the sound and your hair stands on end, except now the baby crying has turned into an all-out banshee scream, as if someone was in anguishing pain. I turned and ran up the stairs, slamming into my sister on my way out the front door, and we both book it as fast as we can to the car. I'm shaking, and my sister is panicking, she heard and felt it from the front porch. We throw the car in reverse and reverse all the way down Nana's driveway, eyes on the front door, almost expecting someone to run out, but no one does. Two officers arrive, and we explain what happens. They enter the house and find nothing. No signs of forced entry and nothing disturbed. To this day, I'm convinced it was Mabel. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.